OK, so. I guess I take it from here. Take it away. All right. Welcome to the assessment inventory and monitoring data use webinar series. I'm Catherine Dyer. I'm the Nevada State Range Program Lead, and I am also the National Outcome Based Grazing Authorization Lead. And the National Outcome Based Grazing Authorization Project is a national initiative. 11 projects were selected in 2018, and um, these 11 projects were selected throughout six states in the West, and this is a large effort intended in the most basic terms at making a national legal and consistent approach to adaptive management, basically in a very cooperative way that allows for real time responses to environmental and operational needs. And so as everyone knows, monitoring is an absolutely key component of Uh, monitoring is an absolutely key component of adaptive management. Sorry about that. And so someone who is fortunately very much um, better at speaking than I am is going to be doing the body of this presentation. Cheryl Newberry is a range management specialist in the Rollins field office and is the lead for one of the 11 national outcome based projects. I do also want to mention that Cheryl and myself and Autumn, who is a range specialist from uh, from Oregon, we were all fortunate enough to also attend the SRM meeting this last uh, February in Denver and presented on outcome based grazing there as well. Those recordings are available on the Intermountain West Joint Venture website, as well as the National Outcome Based Grazing website and there are also several um, presentations regarding AIM, and I did one for Emily, um, which is also recorded and on the um, the AIM SharePoint where, where this recording will also be available. And so enough of me. Cheryl is here to speak about the pH livestock outcome based grazing and the monitoring that is associated with that and contributes to its ability to have meaningful changes in real time. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I'm going to give it a second. I think my screen is up. Does everybody see it? You're good to go, Cheryl. Thank you so much. OK, like Catherine said, um, I work in the Rollins field office. I'm a rangeland management specialist and my talk today is kind of a three prong talk. Um, Catherine did a good um, introduction of outcome based grazing authorization. I'm going to save that for last. First, I'm going to talk about. Um, landscape scale rangeland health assessments in the Rollins field office, followed by how we did our permit renewals on a landscape scale with aim information. And then lastly, outcome based grazing pro uh, the project and the aim related to that. So some background um, in the Rollins field office, like many other places, I'm sure we started out in 98 doing rangeland health assessments on an allotment level. Um, we have over 350 allotments in our field office and we were never going to get done. So. We did that for three years and then we decided we needed to be some do something different. So we basically broke our field office into seven watersheds and we did our uh, health assessments on a watershed basis and we did that. We started in 2001 and we did all seven watersheds and then in 2011 we did it again. Um, and so we are in our second cycle of health assessments in the field office and currently finishing up some of the permit renewals related to that workload. For those of you not familiar, I'd like to point out that in that new tech reference 453 technical note, I'm sorry, 453, um, they list all the rangeland health standards by state, but um, here in Wyoming we have six. Um, and pretty much one through four are what I'm going to focus on 
for this talk, five and six are determined by the state of Wyoming. We do a little bit of talk about it, but generally they're the ones making the call. So having said that, in our field office, our two biggest counties that have a lot of BLM land have no soil surveys, probably will never have a soil survey anytime soon, decades out. Um, there's no ESDs, there's no reference sites. Um, so <laughs> we had to kind of do the best we could. And we are lucky that we have a lot of people that have worked here a long time and have a lot of knowledge and botany information. And so we have a lot of legacy monitoring that we use for our landscape rangeland health assessment. Um, as co of course, we also did PFC reassessments and IRH and those, those standard things. But we really had to kind of use professional judgment a lot more than maybe some other places that actually have a soil survey. The reason we didn't use AIM data for our watershed rangeland health assessments is because Rollins Field Office didn't start doing AIM until 2016, which was kind of towards the end of our assessment. So it, it did the time frame that that go around that time frame didn't work out. The next the next go around, which is coming up in 2021, it should work out perfect and we will use AIM. So after we did our assessments, um, and then uh, learning about AIM in Rollins, we went to the, I went to the training in Grand Junction in 2015, I think in the fall, and our field office decided to jump into a the AIM program and the NOC was awesome. They helped us de develop a sample design to analyze our RMP on kind of a big scale basis. So we started in 2016, this is our fifth year, our last year actually, um, and we did, anywhere from 80 to 100 terrestrial plots per year and 20 to 25 aquatic plots. So we did both starting in 2016. We wanted the whole picture, so we just we just jumped into it. Um, after a couple years, I asked the NOC because I I like doing AIM in the field and I pretty much like doing range work in the field, but I'm not a statistician or anything like that. And so I asked the not to do an analysis on our AIM data to address information regarding standards one through four that we could use on a scientific basis. And just as a point of clarification in our field office, we only use AIM plots that our office did or our contract or GBI did um, because we are very kind of, I don't know if we're unique or not, but we take it very to heart that we know which communities we're in and we have a really strong transition zone between Wyoming sagebrush communities and mountain and so we blacklight everything and some of the LMF plots we couldn't be certain that they had identified the communities accurately and it's a huge difference in what you're meeting as far as grass cover, forb definitely cover, it's just huge and in our field office like in Rollins is 6,800 feet and so there's a 6,800 to 7,200 feet kind of range that we really are concerned about. So so that's just a point of clarification of why we only use AIM plots and not LMF plots at this time. Hopefully moving forward it may not make differences as, as when we have more plots but I guess we'll see. So I'll talk about aquatic AIM first but um, we have an aquatic lead and I'm the terrestrial lead. So as you can see on the screen, there was multiple indicators. Scott was a great help getting us going on that and we're really committed to doing some more of this, doing some rereads and also trying to check out some ephemeral and more um, intermittent sites. But you can see there's the water quality, um, biodiversity and also watershed function for the aquatic game. So in this in this example that I'm talking to you about, it's um, the Great Divide Basin watershed and it's big. It's in Carbon and Sweetwater counties and it consists of two million acres, more more than one million BLM checkerboard a lot of it. Um, and out of the 49 allotments, four failed the riparian standard in 2013. Um, in 2013, because it, we're required, we made adjustments of uh, either projects or rotational um, adjustments 
to help improve those conditions, but they were already moving towards meeting the conditions. They just weren't quite there yet. So when we did the AIM starting in 2016, there had already been three years of time for improvement. And the fact that they were already improving anyway is why I think it didn't flag that area. In addition, aquatic AIM, we are limited in our field office for perennial water. And so it was extremely unlikely that those those randomized plots would have ever hit on a specific failing reach or site. So that's something moving forward in the next go around. We'll probably take a closer look at and see if we need to add a few sites or just, um, you know, cover the ground a little bit better. So lessons learned as we went on and you know that tech reference that just came out. That is awesome and I wish five years would we we would have had that because it would have helped a lot. We kind of just stumbled through, but like I said, the knock really helped. Um, us get through that. So on to terrestrial. Um, we also set up benchmarks to be analyzed and like I said we don't have a lot of ESD information so basically we took some Wyoming soil uh, bare ground kind of studies professional judgment and just monitoring we had and so for bare ground we had some um, differences between different communities. So saltbush less than 65% bare ground, Wyoming sage less than 50, mountain sage less than 30. Um, based on professional judgment, but also data. Um, the other categories that have become crucially important in the last few years in Wyoming is factors that relate to greater sage grouse. And so those factors come straight out of the amendment. Um, in 2015 for greater stage grouse. So they're, they're benchmarks um, as kind of a guide to see if we're actually meeting those habitat requirements for grouse. So here's the map once again of Great Divide watershed. Um, as people are aware that half effort sage grouse habitat assessment framework effort kind of had three different versions, but we started doing half in our field office in the early 2000s. And so you see the blue dots on the map are half transects um, and then the crosshatch is core or priority habitat for grouse. So we've had a pretty good um, legacy kind of monitoring from half for grouse. But one of the things that we found and this is an example of um, what the knot can do for you is get these graphs that are very visually um, easy to understand and basically showing, you know, green is good, red is bad, and where we're meeting suitable sage grouse requirements have for habitat. Um, on this particular slide, I don't have where we failed. So perennial forbs in our field office, especially in the Great Divide Basin, are very much usually unsuitable to marginal, but it's it's mostly because of what the potential of that place is. And, uh, the Great Divide Basin, if anybody knows it, it's driven through I-80. Um, it's, it's a desert. It's six to eight inches of rainfall. So there's just not a lot of production, especially for Forbes. So th that was one thing we're not meeting, but we knew we wouldn't be meeting that. It, we only meet that when we get into the wetter zones with mountain stage. So, um, but yeah, some really great visuals to really demonstrate what we're doing. And then the estimated acreage that, that that graph speaks for is also in the chart. And Alex can talk a lot more about this and I have some other stuff later on, but um, those guys at the NOC can really um, get you whatever you need from the AIM data. So summary of permit renewals and AIM, we're our office is three and a half million acres and we've completed 2.7 million in three watersheds. So we started with the big watersheds of BLM. We have a couple more in the works right now, so we don't have a whole lot of public land left. Um, we have three more watersheds to do, but as I said, um, even th even though those watersheds are don't have a lot of BLM, they're, they're easier in some ways because they have soil surveys and ESDs but they don't have any BLM land, so we don't have a lot of AIM transects to make it representative. So it's going to be a real challenge to see how we're going to use that AIM data in those watersheds and speak for that kind of a landscape. So looking forward to that here in the next year or so. So Catherine gave a, a brief 
explanation of the intent be behind outcome based grazing authorizations. So I'm not going to reiterate a lot of the stuff that she already covered. Like like she said, since September 2017, they started. It's an iterative learning process, so things are adjusted. Adaptive management, fancy fra uh, phrase, but that's what it is. It, and and the thing about this is it's a 10 year time frame, so it's a long term time to see how effective this is going to be um, for grazing management for range to do. Um, it's definitely about partnerships and collaborations, um, but I think the key point is to provide enough flexibility to make decisions quickly because anybody who's in range knows that it's almost impossible to do anything flexibility wise because people want to hold you to the exact permit numbers of animals, dates, those kind of things. And sometimes seasons are different. Sometimes there's rain and it would be better to go in outside of the permit. And those just aren't available to us on a long a large scale right now. So this is hopefully a tool that we can maybe use for flexibility. Rangeland monitoring is huge in this project. Um, and it's 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 short term and long term. So like uh, in my situation, I talk with the ranch all the time, not maybe not weekly, but definitely every couple weeks and depending on what's going on right now, they're shipping or they would probably be part of this presentation. Um, we keep in touch and we make adjustments based on conditions like for the instance this year, it's very dry and hot. And so we had to make some considerations, rotations, those kind of things that we wouldn't have been able to do um, under the regular uh, policy. Like Catherine said, there was 11 demonstration projects selected all over the West, quite a few in Nevada, Idaho, Oregon, Colorado, and one in Wyoming. With that, I'll talk specifically about my project. Um, so pH livestock, is a pretty big ranch in Wyoming and they've been pretty progressive ranchers for a long time. Um, this is once again all in the Great Divide watershed and if you look at this map it's uh, the allotments. I don't know how easy it is to see on this map. There's there's like seven allotments that are outlined in blue um, and and they have over a quarter million acres total um, that they manage. And it's a 60 mile wide swath basically on I-80 and somewhat desert mostly along I-80, but then they have some higher ground and some higher precip ground. So they have quite a bit of variability in their operation. One of the things that come with checkerboard management is challenges and opportunities. Uh, when you have that checkerboard land pattern, you can't really be as it's not as easy as having a solid piece of block BLM and saying, OK, this is what we're going to do because you have different landowners. You have oil and gas companies that own land and the state lands and it's just a lot more complicated. But if you have a shared vision, it's, it, it works out pretty well. And that's that's what's happened with pH livestock over a long period of time. Like I said, this outcome based grazing authorization project is completely included within the Great Divide Basin watershed. It has met standards both um, cycles. Um, so those allotments have met standards since um, we started doing standards. And they also have been meeting AIM benchmarks and honestly have been pretty progressive about trying to manage wildlife habitat along with cattle. We're pretty lucky in our office. Um, a lot of the range people stay here. To, it's a rewarding work environment. Um, it's pretty easy to work with the ranchers. They're pretty progressive. Um, so I've worked with PH for 25 years um, doing different things, um, management basically from day one, monitoring from day one. And so there's a lot of trust that's built up and also a lot of familiarity with the country and the allotments and the issues that that happen. And so we're working for common goals. Obviously, one thing that I can't remember if Catherine mentioned or not in the outcome based grazing authorization program, economic economics for the ranch are highlighted and that's that's not policy in the range regs. Um, so this is a little bit different 
avenue as well where we're actually looking at how to make these ranchers more sustainable economically along with improving rangeland health and wildlife habitat and show that it all goes hand in hand and so hopefully um, these projects will do that i i feel pretty comfortable with ph livestock but like i said we've been working together for a long time some of these outcome based grazing projects are just starting they're just starting to implement um, range improvements they're just starting to work with the ranchers on the ground so we're kind of at the end or not the end but we've been moving along for a while some of these are brand new so i think there's going to be some important lessons learned of how and what works the best in these situations and also <coughs> excuse me also how these authorizations may help benefit some of the ranches we've been working with for a long time so the specifics of my project were <clears throat> um, first and foremost this is usually a big one um, increased flexibility is huge um, so and i didn't include it in the slide but actually it's increased flexibility for all of their allotments all of them so we basically made them as broad scale as we could with as much flexibility for each allotment based on what could possibly happen so that we could have the max maximum rate, range of flexibility for all of the allotments. And then specifically on one allotment, we gave a 20% increase in AUMs. Um, and that is actually the second increase on that allotment in 20 years. So we've done two increases on this allotment. You can see it in the picture. It's very productive mountain sagebrush, um, aspen, mountain shrub communities and there's nine pastures and it's rotated 43,000 acres um, pretty intensively. In fact, that's where they're shipping from today. Um, so a lot of work's gone in there, a lot of range improvements, a lot of water development. I don't know how, uh, how common it is for RMPs to talk about AUMs, but um, I did quote our RMP on the slide basically saying that if standards for healthy rangelands are met, it's a goal of the RMP to maintain and or increase animal unit month levels for livestock grazing. So, so our RMP allows for that. I don't know how many do, but ours definitely does. But that's based on the standards being met, and that includes habitat, that includes vegetation, upland vegetation, riparian vegetation. All of those have to be met before you can even talk about an increase. Some other things the project also analyzed. Um, to cross fences to manage livestock like everybody has heard of. Uh, something that we're trying out, I know Idaho and some other places are way ahead of us, Nevada probably, um, targeted grazing. Uh, we are just getting started. We're making some pastures and we actually have to address not so much cheatgrass, we have some, but crested wheatgrass. Crested wheatgrass was planted along I-80 when the highway went through and also by a lot of the old reclamation in the oil field. And so there's a lot of crested um, in these allotments. And so we're just trying to manage those to try to see if we can't turn them back to a little more native community that has a little bit wider use period, because right now we are so limited in those crested dominated areas. So that's something that we're gonna learn about. We don't have an idea, we're just um, getting started. Lastly on the project is a wildfire management area on that same allotment where we got, uh, gave that increase. Um, it has a lot of aspen, mountain shrub, and sagebrush, and it was burned in 98, and it's already come back to 42% mountain sage in like, what, 22 years, I guess, yeah. Um, and so we're just saying if, if lightning strikes, and it's, it's beneficial to the resource, it's an aspen stand or it's a below an aspen stand, we're going to let it burn and see manage it that way um, to improve the landscape. So we're looking forward to that. So the EA that was done was finished in September and was finalized or final in October. We didn't receive any protests or appeals. And I should say also um, we're lucky in Rollins because even for our permit renewals, even for most everything we do, we don't ever get protested or appealed. So, 
so we're lucky so we can pretty much do our job and we don't have to go to court or justify it but i think we have enough monitoring to justify everything we're doing anyway so i think i think that having that baseline monitoring and proving what we have and putting these landscape assessments together has been a great defense for what we do on the ground and so i'm hoping it continues this way um but yeah i just wanted to throw out there that we haven't had that challenge some of the things we've been doing on our project we like to try different things we like to be innovative um and so as part of the outcome based grazing authorization we've we've gotten some help money wise as far as um doing some things on the ground and so one of the things that we did look at doing we bought some weather stations and wyoming has a climate system that they have in place so we just bought three weather stations to tie into that and it covers an area that's not covered by Wyoming because it's not irrigated land. And so I think we fill this niche in Wyoming that isn't felt isn't filled by the agricultural side of things. So I think that'll be helpful to the state as, as a whole. Um, we also have been doing things like. I know a lot of people use game cameras for game cameras, but um, we started using them in livestock tanks and they're actually real time, so in the morning you can have a photo sent to your phone to make sure that there's water in all those troughs for wildlife and livestock without having to drive out and check them you can actually see real-time photos you can put them in tanks you can put them wherever and and it saves a lot of time as far as that goes um, as far as doing different things we're also experimenting with different materials we have just ordered some high tensile barbed fence we we're trying some plastic composite posts, solar fences and wireless systems. Everybody's probably familiar with those. There's some pictures of some continuous fence we built on a ridge top where there was a crucial winter range um, and mule deer and antelope. And it, we put in some game cams just for the game and we really saw some really neat things. They really liked the fence. The deer love to go under it um, and the antelope, of course, too. They all kind of just like hanging at it. Um, so, so definitely innovation, definitely things we've been trying to, you know, learn from and get out there and try to make people's life easier and do a better job. One thing that's been really important with PH Livestock is they've always had a commitment to monitoring. They've spent 30 years monitoring, paying for monitoring, paying their people to come out and help us monitor, or getting the University of Wyoming involved. And so there's been a lot of different types of legacy monitoring on this project um, that we've used. And as part of the outcome based grazing, there's a requirement that you have a cooperative monitoring agreement. So we basically revised what we had been what we had had in the past and updated it with all the monitoring objectives and protocols and a lot of the transects and information that we had um, done in the past, a lot of LPI, a lot of things like that we're kind of converting if, if it makes sense we're converting them over to aim over the long term just because it's the protocol is so good we feel so comfortable with the aim protocol we figure it'd just be better to have it all standardized rather than having bunches of different types of monitoring where where it's practical and there's just a highlight at the bottom of the slide that talks about the mou that was redone in 2018 like I said, PH has always been responsive to monitoring. They've always been committed. I mean, it's it's something they they are committed to and they will always do. Um, we reread a lot of legacy monitoring. We have a lot of monitoring on all of their allotments, um, many kinds, sample point, HRM transects from the 90s, which is holistic resource management transects, a lot of water table monitoring, a lot of different things that you know with monitoring things pop up like grouse and you need to put out monitoring for grouse and things like that happen so we have to be pretty adaptive um lately we've been incorporating aim over the last five years and we also are trying to incorporate or i guess switch our halves over to aim just because then it's more um following that protocol and we don't have a lot of differences but the key point there is we always monitor together. It's always a, it's always together so everybody sees what's happening on the ground together. And 
and although although you can't be everywhere because they have a lot of land, um, they also take photos and send them to me, email like when they get the cattle out of the pasture in case I you know don't get a chance to get out there. They have it pretty much real time so that I know what's going on and we're keeping in touch with everything that's that's been going on for the year. I should say also that as part of this project, there's an annual reporting requirement, basically kind of a summary of how the year went. And so, like I said, this is the first year since the EA was signed that we'll be doing some different things. So it should be pretty exciting. Um, this is uh, a pretty good picture of one of the higher elevation areas that they have. And I think I think a key point, um, especially where we have to work in the checkerboard, um, outcome based grazing provides for public and la private lands managed together and monitored together and in the checkerboard it makes sense to not look at where the yellow line is on the map it makes sense to put the monitoring where it's going to tell you the most and so we're kind of working through that I know with our aim points they've been randomly located on BLM um, a lot of the old legacy points we're mostly or probably 50% of private. So we're just kind of working our head around how that's going to change and how we can be representative for the whole project. So what's next for Rollins? Um, in 2022, we're back to Great Divide Basin again for the third round. Um, and getting back to that new tech reference, I think it's important to kind of look at that because of course, you know, where those allotments failed for PFC, we'll go back and revisit those and see if they're now at PFC. We'll also revisit P, uh, riparian areas um, where we may think that we might have some problems or we may just do some randomized kind of sampling to just make sure that everything's still doing good riparian wise. The aim plots uh, will be reread, um, but I don't know what percentage. I put 10% on this slide because I was thinking of terrestrial. I'm not sure if that's going to be the case for aquatic. I think we're going to have to take a hard look and talk to the NOC about what their recommendations are for that. And then, like I said, we've been converting uh, legacy monitoring where practical to aim protocol. The good thing is, is this go around, this third go around, if you're meeting standards, if the allotments are meeting standards, let's just say all of the allotments meet standards, then you wouldn't even have to do a permit renewal for anything. So I think that the workload each go around of the landscape health assessment, the work has gotten less and less and the improvement on the ground is more focused. And so that's been a good learning tool for us and really kind of identified how we're going to cycle through these areas. Um, lastly, uh, I just have a link on this page that is to the partners in the sage.com um, and they actually have some really great write ups of all the outcome based grazing projects, some pictures and what's going on. So that's a good place to get more information if you're interested. I think I think and Catherine can correct me, but I think the intent is if this works well, we want to roll it out to more people and see how we can get this maximized flexibility while still improving the land. In addition, also there's a post poster that Alex put together was um, for the Ecological Society um, that basically much better than what I could do explained how we kind of did this process through Rollins um, going with AIM and then benchmarks and all of that. And he'll have that posted um, uh, on the AIM website sometime in the future so keep an eye out for that um having said that i just that's the end of my presentation so i'm done thank you cheryl um that was a wonderful presentation um yeah and thanks a lot for giving it i think it's a you kind of illustrated a really good example of how so many different parts of monitoring and range management can kind of come together in a, in a good way. So thanks again um, for that. Um, just a, a reminder to folks, if you do have questions for Cheryl, um, you can type them in the Q&A box um, up in the top right corner of your screen and we can try and get those answered for you now. Um, 
And if you do have any follow up questions, feel free to refer to that intro slide and, and reach out to, to any of us over email. Uh, but Cheryl, we do have a, a couple of questions for you here lined up. Um, the first one here is from Alan, who who says it was mentioned that a range land health evaluation was done at a watershed scale. Uh, one slide mentioned four allotments did not meet one or more standard. Did the office make a call at the watershed scale and and the allotment scale on meeting or not meeting standards? So how did you kind of break up um, uh, those standards? Did it was it at the kind of watershed scale or or at the allotment scale or both in the end? So that's a great question, and that's the thing about landscape scale assessments. Certain things have to be done in allotment level. Certain things are more landscape. So for instance, like wildlife habitat, um, migration corridors, those are big scale kind of pictures. However, um, riparian areas that fail due to livestock grazing are allotment based, and so it comes down to the allotment level. And a lot of those, a lot, not a lot, those four allotments that were failing, like I said, this is the second go around. The first go around, I think there was 11 that failed. So we got it down to four and they're, they're fairly limited sites. Um, a lot of them, I think two of the, th two of the four are actually um, seeps, but um, they're livestock related. And that's why those, those management changes were done in 2013. So that is on the allotment level. So those are, and when we report it, failing for livestock by livestock on a riparian area is reported at the allotment level. Habitat for wildlife, uh, upland vegetation tends to be more landscape based. So it just depends on what you're talking about specifically. Great, thank you. Um, another question here from Lindsay is about uh, use space monitoring, utilization monitoring. Um, so when do you use use and utilization monitoring? How do you choose use monitoring locations for OBG permits? And do you co-locate with aim plots? Great question, Lindsay, thanks. That is a great question. Um, our office generally doesn't do a lot of use-based monitoring. We tend to do a lot more trend monitoring. And so, like I said, um, with the um, real time, short term kind of use levels, it's more of a um, eye um, photo kind of utilization or just a run through. We don't ha set up specific monitoring sites unless we need to. So I would say that compared to a lot of other offices, we're more focused on what the trend of the rangeland is doing versus what the actual use levels are for that pasture at that time. And so, and that's actually worked to our benefit because it means we can spend more time doing trend monitoring versus measuring the height of grass. Um, but like I said, for each pasture in this outcome-based grazing authorization, we are documenting use levels. And we've been doing that for a long time because we have elk crucial winter range, so we need to make sure there's use there for the elk in the winter. So. A um, little bit different tact that our office has take, taken on that use kind of monitoring. Cool, thank you. Um, we did get some support here for a comment from Anonymous that says, yeah, for, for Rollins using uh, fire for resource benefits, so there's good positive feedback there. Um, another question here from an anonymous source says uh, you mentioned that you have a device to send uh, photos of stock tanks every day. Were those game cameras or some other technology? So those are game cameras. We actually have some that we've used for wildlife monitoring where would they beam a photo once a day to us. Um, but you just ba buy basically a card that's in it like a Verizon kind of type card and it usually has most of those game cams that they're the higher end game cams. I think they run quite a bit more than your standard 200 300 dollar game cam. But if anybody's interested, they can shoot me an email and I can get them the specifics. But basically it'll take as many photos as you want and send it to your your email um, or your phone so that you can real time see those kind of sites. So it's been a huge help and and definitely I think worth the investment. 
yeah, it's super cool to see that kind of technology being used. Um, another question here is about the the revisits here of AIM sites. So, how are you determining the the ten percent of AIM plots to be reread on the twenty twenty two assessment? So, um, I think that's referring to kind of which which of those AIM plots are you planning on on rereading? Um, so it's it's kind of interesting in our case because when we set up our our aim design, it was to measure the effectiveness of the RMP. So it was the whole field office. So we had a five year draw. So it was for the whole field office for five years in a row. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that each watershed had five different years of plots in it. And so I think we'll probably first take a look at what was read the oldest, like 2016, 2017. And then also look at where, whether we think that that's more likely to have changed um, and then kind of go from there. I think that we are going to look for some more guidance and information and help from the NOC on trying to, you know, be scientific about that, but also try to figure out a process because moving forward with all the watersheds, we're going to be looking at looking at that for the next eight years. So. My my feeling is, yeah, we'll just look at what's what the, where the older aim plots are, and especially you know, Wyoming sage sites, saline sites, and then kind of make a call from those which ones we should reread. But I'm kind of open to suggestions. I don't think a lot of people have done a lot of aim rereading, at least not in Wyoming, and so definitely any suggestions or help <laughs> will definitely be considered because we have a, a year to figure it out. Absolutely, and that's something that um, like myself and others at the NOC are, are happy to help with. It often kind of stems from, you know, what, what your real management objectives are and, and then looking at the sample size um, to see how we can best address those objectives. Um, but yeah, that's something that, that us and the Hornado can, can absolutely help out with. Um, thank you for Lauren. Uh, Lauren just copied the technical reference into the chat there. So that's um, referring to um, the using AIM and LMF data in grazing permit renewals and, and land health evaluations. Um, so there's a link there if, if anyone missed that. Um, oh, and there's a there is a clarification here on the 10 percent question. So um, it was just how are you choosing which sites to reread and how do you decide on the 10 percent number? I think you kind of got at that a little bit, but um, does that clarification help, Cheryl? Yeah, so I think that um, the reason I think that we we picked the 10% out of the air is because um, we we weren't sure. This, this is the first year we weren't able to get a contracting for AIM done in our field office, so we didn't get 80 plots done. We're hoping to get 40 done because we're doing them in-house with our permanent staff. We always do some in-house with our permanent staff, but we also usually get some help. Um, looking out, we weren't sure if we were going to get any kind of monetary help for AIM monitoring, so that 10% is based on permanent staff doing the monitoring. Perfect, thank you. Um, some more uh, support here and, and thank you for your great presentation here from Kelly Michelson. Um, and I absolutely second that. Thanks so much for your presentation, Cheryl. Um, and I think we have just one last question. Um, so last chance here to kind of uh, to answer to ask any questions to Cheryl, but the, the last question here was just uh, what size watershed are you, are you using? And, so how did you kind of go about about uh, how did you go about uh, splitting your field office into those seven watersheds? So I'm not a hydrologist, but we um, went with I think third or fourth order watersheds and then combined them to what made sense um, in our and they're posted on ePlanning, so you can take a look at our watershed reports. They're under our RMP. Um, basically, we we went through that level first. We went to the watershed level and made determinations of watersheds first, and then we kind of, 
you know how allotments will sometimes split over into a different watershed so we just made a call of which watershed they were going to be analyzed in so i mean it's 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 there's a lot of technical kind of stuff as far as how that worked out but i would definitely say that if you need some guidance on how we broke that um in our field office um that's posted on e-planning those those um rangeland health assessments all of them are posted on e-planning so you don't have to print them out you can just get down there and take a look and see how we broke that out by allotment and what and and at the time when we did it there was a washington i am or something that basically um recommended doing rangeland health assessments on a watershed basis and so we just went with that and that's quoted also in the um, rangeland health assessments that we did so there's definitely more information there, but also, you know, if anybody wants to talk to me or direct or shoot me an email and get more information from me, feel free. I'll be more than happy to help because it certainly maximized our efforts and and reduced our paperwork. So, I mean, when you do a permit renewal, like in the Colorado watershed, we had 120 allotments and it only took two EAs for 120 allotments. So, I mean, it's just a really good efficiency kind of work in progress. So definitely I I I would I would recommend it doing it that way. So I appreciate everybody's comments and questions. They've been great. Absolutely. Thanks again, Cheryl. Uh, this is a great presentation and uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure working with you on on, on some of the analysis for some of these things. Um, I think I'll just hand it over to Alita to to close and wrap up, but thanks again. Cheryl. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Cheryl. That was a fabulous presentation. Um, this is your last opportunity to go ahead and type in more questions while we do this. So if you do type in a question while we're still online, we will go ahead and break to answer it. So this and all other recordings um, can be found on the BLM AIM SharePoint, which is shown on this slide. You can find the upcoming presentations also there, as well as on aim.landscapetoolbox.org. And next week, we will have ecological site summaries and applications for condition thresholds and treatment monitoring, which should hopefully be as exciting as today's was. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate your participation and all your wonderful questions. See you next week.